Here the church confesses that life becomes a constant death for Christ's sake. It becomes a life of cross-bearing. And that cross does not consist of headache or rheumatism or some other miseries. It is rather that the church drinks to intoxication the blood of the faithful witnesses, and that the beast opens wide his mouth. Through all this we must pass, and such is possible only when we cleave unto him with a true faith and a firm hope. Let us realize that it really means something to look into the cruel jaws of the beast or to call the harlot by her actual name. Then the marriage feast seems too unattainable and so unreal, something with which one can't accomplish a thing. But still I believe that it is possible to hold fast this hope. God not only gives us the assurance, these are the true words of God, he also confirms this by the facts. What we see and experience in church and world today is precisely what John saw from afar. And as history is unfolded still more, we shall see more clearly that these were not the visions of a frenzied fanatic, but the true words of God. But when history demonstrates that the beginning of the prophecy concerning the end is true, then it becomes easier to expect the conclusion of this drama. The harlot decks herself in finery. The seventh head of the beast is being more sharply outlined. This we see with our own eyes. But if these beginnings are real, then I know for sure that the conclusion is true. Then I am convinced that the marriage is approaching. The beast rises from the dead, and all men join in worshipping. This is precisely what John has told us. The harlot arrays and intoxicates herself. This is precisely what God has announced. But then the marriage feast will also surely come to pass. The word of God is corroborated by the facts. The apostasy of the church and the return of the monster demonstrates that God does not lie. Therefore these times teach me to hold more firmly to the word than ever, and to hope for the great supper of the marriage of the Lamb. Cleave to him with ardent love, so we pray in the forum for baptism. Now concerning that ardent love, our text concludes with a most remarkable announcement. John was deeply moved when the angel said that all the agitated and chaotic history of the world was so made by God that the marriage supper of the Lamb would come. To himself he says, How great is this angel! He is prophesying the end of the ways of God in history, because he could tell me all these things. And not only does he prophesy all this, he is also one of the actors who pours out the final files of wrath. Thus, this angel assists in realizing the end of history and the complete deliverance of the church. He not only announces the end, he also makes the end. Then in John's soul arose such deep reverence for this mighty angel, mighty in word and deed, mighty in prophecy and fulfillment, that before he realized what he was doing, he fell upon his knees to worship. To himself he thought, How dwarfies am I, and the church consists only of dwarfs. But the angel at once made an end of this. What's out? See you do not do it. Am I great, great in word today, and great in works after a while? I am even as yourself, only a servant of God. John, God alone is great and greatly to be praised. He alone has thought out this road which brings the church to the wedding. He alone has revealed to me this mystery of salvation. He alone is the one who will bring world history to an end, who alone will destroy the harlot and trample upon the dragon. God alone is great, worship him. For this plan is his, and this prophecy is his. And soon also this marriage feast is his alone. I am but his servant. John said not the servant above nor even next to his Lord. Do not esteem me so highly. Nor must you think so lowly of yourself. For you fall upon your knees and say, How small and insignificant am I compared with you. But this is not true. Am I, because of this word, and because of the pouring out of the last plagues by and by, any greater than you? I simply stand next to you. I am only a servant of God, and cling to the testimony of Jesus Christ. Am I a prophet, John? Well, so are you. 
For Pentecost has come, and all who cling to the testimony of Jesus Christ have received since the day of Pentecost the spirit of prophecy. As a servant I am, indeed, God's prophet, but so are you and all those others who together with you proclaim the testimony of Jesus Christ and hold fast to the gospel, even at the cost of their lives. And do not say to yourself, but what will happen later on? Do not say to me, you and your fellow angels will take an active part in unleashing judgment upon the harlot and in preparing for the wedding, while we as men will only watch without working. This is not true, for I prophesy, but you who maintain the word of Christ and seek with that gospel to bring the world salvation are prophesying just as well. And after a while I will receive in my hand a file full of wrath and pour this out. Then I will be doing something, but you and your brothers will be doing no less. For you who keep God's commandments and maintain the testimony of Jesus are struggling in word and deed for the salvation of the world and the apostate church. Ah no, you will not convert them all, but your prophetic word and evangelical deed is still a power in this world. If not unto conversion, then unto hardening. Your word and deed are active powers, powers of the Holy Spirit, by means of which he ripens the world for the end. Say not, John, when an angel speaks, then I do well to be silent. For your word is fully as significant and fully as much a power in the end time. Say not, now that I have seen what after a while the angels will do, I can put my hands in my pocket. For by means of word and deed, godly walk and prophetic witness, you are bringing in the end of history, as much as I in my place. John, God alone is great, therefore worship him. Men and angels stand next to each other, in word and deed, as God's servants. In this way they steer the world towards the last day in which the harlot is condemned and the beast destroyed. And therefore, John, love God. Worship him together with the whole church as the Lord of history. Worship him whose connection with the harlot and the beast brings his true church to the marriage feast. And love also your fellow men. Open your mouth together with all your brothers. Proclaim the gospel of Christ. Cling to it in the face of an anti-Christian world and an apostate church. And keep God's commandments. Never take part in the abominations of the harlot or the blasphemies of the beast. Did you understand this? Ah, none of us will be tempted today to worship an angel. But have you not experienced that other temptation of feeling ourselves to be so insignificant and powerless? Increasingly we have an oppressive sense of our own insignificance. Men laugh about us. All the abominations of our day we could not restrain. Meanwhile our government acts and the Security Council acts. But does the Church have any influence? Indeed, the apostate Church, the great city of adultery, does. But that little handful of us? We feel so helpless in world events. Of all of history we say, I stand there simply as a spectator, unable to do a thing about it. We suppose we can do something only when our men become cabinet members and when we are supported by an organization numbering hundreds of thousands. But we ought to be cured of this illusion once and for all. Who really is significant in the world? He who understands history in the light of God's word and therefore takes notice of the beast and the harlot. He who loves Christ's church with all his heart and therefore hates all of adultery within the church and all ungodliness in disciplining the true children of the church. He who believes that today God is preparing for the coming marriage feast and therefore dares to face the future. He whose hope is more firmly fixed on the new Jerusalem with every passing day because he sees the word being fulfilled. He who worships only God as Lord of history and is aware of his place next to that of the angels. He who in his own small corner keeps the commandments of God and clings to the testimony of Jesus Christ even when men ridicule him. He who in word and deed dares to stand alone, not concerned for a moment about how many people will back him up because he knows angels stand next to me 
and God stands above me. Who makes history? Not a gentleman at Lake Success, but a simple soldier in the Indies, with whose life the leaders are gambling, but who in his own company keeps God's commandments and is not ashamed of confessing Christ. Who makes history? Not the laborers who press their claims through the big union, but the man who quietly keeps God's law in relation to his employer. The father who tells his children about the gospel, and the mother who puts a Christian stamp on her family, even though everyone in the neighborhood avoids them as somewhat peculiar. Not the cabinet minister who flies every week to some important conference, but the patient who has been confined for some years to the same small bed in the same small room, and there clings to the testimony of Christ. Not the man who is very active in the ecumenical movement, but a simple church member who in the hour of decision refused to tolerate within the church the slaying of his brothers and infidelity to God's covenant, and therefore was not ashamed of the liberation. Footnote. Holveda is again referring to the liberation of 1944, when Professor Dr. Klaas Gulder was suspended and deposed from office by Synod, and therefore was not ashamed of the liberation, and not inspired by the striving for false unity, even though others called him narrow-minded and refused to continue as his customers. Do you ask about the millions? These you will find following the beast. Are you looking for the hundred thousands? They arrange themselves with the harlot. But blessed is the man who remains faithful to God when the whole church denies him, who remains faithful to the brothers when everyone tolerates their slaying, who in word and deed confesses, I believe, a holy Catholic church, even when he has to stand alone. Blessed is the man who is small and bows humbly before God, but who also stands up courageously and does not depend on man, but takes his place next to the angels, and in covenant with them proclaims God's word, and in regal fashion keeps God's commandments, knowing, as God's servant, I together with the angels am setting all of history in motion towards the day of the great marriage feast. For in very truth, this is the man, although he may have to stand all alone and be effectively isolated in daily life, who mingles his voice with that of the innumerable multitude, roaring like the sea and rumbling like thunder. Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. And we are traveling towards the great marriage feast. For by word and deed he helps to bring that day nearer, on which God will say also to him, Blessed are you, for you are called to the supper of the marriage of the Lamb. These are the true words of God.